and grafted onto it. And when that happened, a sort of ontological rug was pulled out from under alchemy. It could no longer work based on the atomistic theory because the whole thing is based on the perfection of the growth of metals, having subjectivity, souls that grow and become perfect over time. All that's done away with, with the atomistic theory. So you have the atomistic theory for the microcosm and the sort of clockwork mechanical theory for the macrocosm and the clockwork theory, and Kepler was an astrologer as well as a mathematician, but here he's doing death to the astrological vision. It no longer, how is it that in a mechanistic universe the planets are going to exert influential effects on earthly things? They would have to radiate somehow through the gravitational field. Uh, now we're reverting to Einstein. There was no gravitational field. At this time, it was simply uh, a mysterious force acting on objects from a distance. And because of that mystery dimension, it took Newton a long time to get accepted uh, because his theory was initially thought to have occult properties, to be just a sort of fancy dressing up of a kind of astrological theory. But once it did get picked up, uh, and Descartes rejected it. Descartes had a different theory. Descartes had a weird uh, vortex theory that the planets were pushed along. Uh, he had this atomistic theory, and there are these vortices moving constantly through matter, and on a macrocosmic scale, they're actually pushing the planets along. So it's, it's a very mechanistic theory. So for a while, Descartes' theory of motion with respect to the planets was taught and accepted um, because it wasn't mysterious. It was very tangible and mechanistic. So that, the 17th century, then is the death knell of the vision of the anima mundi and the sort of pulling out of the ontological foundations for both alchemy and astrology. Alchemy was the earthly version of astrology and vice versa. And um, so that's the, the crucial uh, period there. Now for the last four revolutions, we'll move through those more quickly. Um, as we move into the 18th century, <clears throat> so the anima mundi has been discredited, but the biblical vision still persists. It's, it has somewhat more tenacious. And uh, <clears throat> a very severe blow was dealt to it by the Kant and Laplace theory of the evolution of the solar system. And uh, Kant's paper dates to 1755, and Laplace is to the very end of the uh, 18th century. And these two men simply figured out independently of each other that it was possible that the solar system was not created by God, but had spun itself into being. It was like they had, in fact, they had picked up Descartes' vortex theory of matter, which now no longer worked to push the planets along, but they picked it up, sort of pulled a vortex out of it, expanded it, and thought, well, you know what, maybe the entire solar system emerged out of a single spinning vortex of dust and gas. If that's the case, then we don't need a god bringing it into being. And so the Kant Laplace theory really uh, uh, was a heavy hammer blow to the biblical vision. Of uh, Laplace wrote his work, Celestial Mechanics, and he had a discussion with Napoleon, and Napoleon asked him, he said, where is there room for God in this vision? And Laplace said, characteristic of the French rationalism, sire, I have no need for that hypothesis. You know, God was reduced to a mere hypothesis here in the 18th century, being gradually pushed out of the picture. <clears throat> and also in the 18th century, uh, around about 1785, we have the Hattonian Revolution. James Hutton publishes his work on the Uniformitarian Theory of, the, of Geology. Now, it had been thought in the 17th century, it was taught by Bishop Usher, that the Earth was created precisely in 4004 BC and on a Thursday. And um, <laughs> that's pretty good. Very precise. Well, Hutton began to figure out that you could actually account for the origin of the Earth's crust if you expanded that time frame to an indefinite time frame. Hutton refused to give a definite date, hundreds of millions of years, say. and Instead, imagine this mechanical theory of water, rivers slowly carving out the crust of the Earth through processes of sedimentation, lithification, stratification. It would require millions of years, but it, it could work if you expanded that time frame. So Hutton published that uniformitarian theory of geology, which is actually incorrect. Nowadays, it's reverted back to its original precursor, Cuvier, and his catastrophe theory. And this was parallel. Uh, uh, parodied by Goethe's Faust as uh, the Neptunists versus the Vulcanists, where the Earth gives these cosmic explosive upheavals for Cuvier, and fossils could be explained because God would periodically wipe out cre uh, creatures and then create new ones. But he rejected the theory of evolution. And um, so then, um, picking up from this uniformitarian hypothesis, Lyell, in 1830 then, as part of the Hattonian Revolution, simply gives it a more elegant formulation in his three-volume Principles of Geology, 
and says, well, the earth is hundreds of millions of years old, at least. And um, that just pushes the Christian dates out of the water. Forget about them. They, they just won't apply. And Lyell's new, Lyell's and Hutton's new time frames for the age of the earth now becomes the canvas upon which Darwin paints his theory of evolution because now evolution, the sixth, the Darwinian revolution, and Darwin publishes his book in 1859 on the origin of species. Back when he had gone on the voyage of the Beagle, uh, Beagle he had taken Lyell's print three volume. It's a massive thing, too. Was that the date 18? <clears throat> 1859? <clears throat> uh, Darwin had taken Lyell's principles of geology with him as this sort of sacred text. And it's ironic because Lyell rejected the theory of evolution. But Darwin saw it as creating a new time canvas for him to paint the theory on. <clears throat> and the theory is based simply on the two-fold dialectic of random mutations. Organisms are constantly sort of spitting out, almost mechanically, these random, purposeless mutations. And they are acted upon by the selective pressures, the forces of the environment. And a Malthusian trap is the classic case where you have a diminishing food supply, and you have these mutations. And those mutations will be selected by the situation, by nature herself, which will best enable those organisms to get the food and reproduce, pass on their genes. So it's a very mechanical theory, but it's consistent with Lyell. It's consistent with the, the mechanistic vision here. So Darwin has translated biology into mechanics, and that is why, still today, uh, that's the, the primary theory that's taught by academics who are still entrenched in the materialistic vision of the world. And then finally, we have then uh, the seventh great revolution uh, is the uh, sort of Einstein's relativity and at the same time, because they happen about the same time, quantum mechanics. And uh, this is interesting because with the seventh and sort of final revolution that we're living in now, the mechanistic picture itself begins to dissolve, or at least begins to become circumscribed. And the, um, we have new sets of laws that begin coming in and operating at different levels. Um, Quantum mechanics resulted as uh, uh, Max Planck studying energy radiation, and he began to figure out that energy does not radiate smoothly, but in these little packets. Was that about 1900? Right around there, 1900, almost exactly. And um, these little packets are quanta, and they can be mathematically predicted, and you can go into all of that. And then that became fused with the atomistic theory. And the early model of the atom was taught as a kind of miniature version of the solar system, but that was an attempt to translate it back into mechanics. In actual fact, Atoms are so mysterious that they cannot be thought of in rational language. You have to have a sort of double aspect language where occasionally particles will behave as particles, occasionally they will behave as waves. It depends on how the experiment is designed. And sometimes they appear to do both. So they defy the Aristotelian categories of logic that the mechanistic vision very much depends upon. So that sort of began to erode. And then um, um, you began to get mysterious a-causal phenomena. You have Heisenberg's uncertainty principle where we cannot pin down the position of the particle and the velocity of it at the same time. If you go for the position, you'll do damage to the velocity. If you want the velocity, you're going to disturb the position but just by measuring it. So we have this new uncertainty that begins to creep in, and the theory of causality that mechanics depends upon begins to erode because now we have weird phenomena like uh, spontaneous radioactive decay. Nobody still knows what causes that. It just happens, and it can be mapped mathematically, and we can use it uh, to date things. But nobody knows why these atoms decay spontaneously, mysteriously. And uh, so quantum mechanics opens up this whole new uh, mysterious realm that cannot be encompassed neatly by the rational categories. And then Einstein, uh, independently, in about the same time, 1905, publishes a series of uh, papers, one in particular, that turns physics upside down because <clears throat> Einstein's theory of uh, special relativity looks at light also. He's looking at light, and light is being, quantum mechanics starts from the mystery of light radiation. And he thinks, well, what would it be like to ride alongside a light wave? Let's assume light is a wave. What would it be like to ride alongside of it? Would I be able to see my own image in a mirror that I was holding up? I mean, how would that be possible? Because the light would have to catch the mirror and then bounce back. So he began sort of working with this paradox and became obsessed with it. And the paper that resulted in 1905 um, sort of turned everything upside down because now he, he says um, <clears throat> three things will happen to a particle if it, or any object were it to attain light speed. But the only objects that can attain light speed are light particles because they're massless. That's a mystery. But if an object were to attain light speed, three things would happen to it. It would collapse into two-dimensionality, time would stop for it, and it would gain infinite mass. 
And since that's why light particles can go light speed because they don't have any mass, they don't gain.